Radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock, the Labour leader is accusing Boris Johnson's government of being too out of touch to make the changes the UK needs. Sir Keir Starmer's been addressing the Queen's speech. No immediate extra help for households struggling with rising inflation was announced, but Exchequer Secretary Helen Waitley told LBC the government's concentrating on long-term measures. Many of the bills uh, that have been announced there, those 38 bills, those bills will help drive economic growth. So it's through economic growth, through creating the conditions when people will be in higher skilled, higher paid jobs, then people will be able to afford. The sister of a black man who died in police custody has told an inquiry she no longer feels safe in Scotland. Sheikh Bayo passed away in May 2015 after being restrained by officers in Fife. It's being likened to the death of George Floyd in America. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge have attended a memorial service for the victims of the 2017 Manchester Arena attack. Prince William says it was important for him to be there. And a lower low actor, Robin Parkinson's, died at the age of 92. His career spanned more than four decades, including being featured on The Young Ones and Girls About Town. LBC Markets report the FTSE 100 closed up 27 points at 72.43. The pound buys $1.23 and €1.17. LBC weather staying cool with showers in the north, cloudy with patchy rain in the south, a low of seven. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Serena Farrow. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross question with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening to you. It's Tuesday's Cross Question. It's two minutes past eight. I'm Ian Dale. With me in the studio to take your questions are Richard Holden, the Conservative MP for North West Durham, Emily Carver, is Head of Media at the Institute of Economic Affairs and a columnist on conservativehome.com, Sarah Said is a lawyer and co-founder of Action for Afghanistan, and Christian Wakeford is Labour MP for Bury South, who crossed the floor of the House earlier this year, as you may well remember. Uh, 0345 is the number to call and you can watch us on Global Player. Call 0345 60 60 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84 850 cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Welcome to you all. Let's get cracking with Martin in Doncaster. Martin, hi. What's your question, please? Hi, I'm Ian and panel. Yeah, but I, I'm on the sick and I'm having to borrow money to help with the cost of living. What help in the Queen's speech was there for me today? Richard Holden. Well, I think the biggest, uh, most important thing that we can do, there's two elements to that. One is around the NHS. I don't know what your call is uh, on the sick for. I don't know if it's a mental health issue or a physical health issue, but uh, if it's mental health related, then there is going to be a new bill forwards to help uh, with uh, mental health services. On the other side, obviously one of the biggest things that we're doing is really helping to drive forwards, uh, getting rid of the COVID backlog in the NHS. So if there's, if he's waiting for an operation or something like that, that's uh, a huge amount we're putting in there. But I think more broadly, the biggest thing that we can do is uh, deal uh, with the economy and ensure that it keeps going. We've seen half a million more people now on payroll uh, than before the pandemic, which is good news. We've got to keep that going. We've had the fastest growth last year in the G7. It's going to be a tough time with rising prices at the moment. Um, but, uh, that's, and that, but that's the most important thing. But that's the problem, isn't it? That inflation will erode any wage rises because you're not going to get 10% wage rises or if we get or are we going back to the 1970s when there was this sort of um, competition between wage rises and, and inflation if your wages don't keep up with inflation inevitably people are going to be worse off and you, you know as well as I do one of the questions which the opposition will be asking you at the next election uh, or, you, or the, they, they will be asking the electorate is are you better off than you were four years ago and at the moment, the answer to that question seemingly would be no. No, I think that's a fair point. I think following the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, we've seen a massive spike in prices, doubling in the oil price, quadrupling in the gas price, 50% increase in prices of things like uh, wheat, which of which Ukraine's a major exporter. Um, obviously, that's had a huge knock-on. It is a one, uh, is a one-off 
uh, in rise in inflation, so hopefully that won't feed through in future years. Um, but we'll have to see um, what happens. Obviously, the government's put in quite a lot of cash already. Um, it was £150 going out to most households uh, at the moment. I know some some people are getting it from their councils at the moment. I got mine through the other day from Durham County Council. Um, that's really important that that goes into those households as quickly as possible to help them. Uh, and then uh, later in the year, the extra £200 coming through in, uh, to try and smooth the price rises. But those, those are the most important things we can do. But I know the Queen's speech is not a budget and a lot of our callers in the last hour were saying, well, couldn't they have done this up the other? And I said, well, no, that, that is what you do in a budget speech rather than a Queen's speech. But these Westminster niceties don't really matter to people out there who, who are suffering at the moment. Was, was there nothing that you think could have been done to, ju to at least signal that the government is in touch with the British people, certainly those at the bottom end of the income. Well, I think there's a huge amount that's already been done, and you can see actually what's coming forwards in July this year is a rise in the national rate, the, the point at which you start to pay national insurance. <coughs> so anybody who's earning uh, under £36,000 will see a pretty significant tax cut, which is over 70% of uh, people uh, in the uh, who are in work, which is, a, I think, a great thing. Um, and that's uh, and that's alongside uh, some other things we've done, raising the national living wage to nine pounds fifty an hour. That's going to really help uh, a lot of people. A thousand pounds for somebody on the national living wage. Um, also reducing the uh, taper rate. Uh, universal credit sounds slightly complex, but for a, a family that uh, on universal credit that can make up to a thousand pounds a year difference. That's something we've done in the last few months. So there are things kicking in now, and that and that taper rate only kicks kicks, kicks up in 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 eight. Uh, kicked in in April, and we've got the further national insurance cut um, coming uh, down the line in, in July. Sarah Zaidi, let's remind ourselves of the question from Martin. I'm having to borrow money to cope with the cost of living. What is there in the Queen's speech for me? I'm afraid my opinion is that it didn't go far enough <coughs> for, the, um, for those who are really struggling right now. Um, part of my day job is working often on inequalities issues and I hear stories of those really struggling. I mean, literally a choice between feeding and heating. Um, and I think, for example, I mean, in a Queen's speech, as you rightly say, both of you, there can only be big ticket, quest big ticket sort of headlines, but I think there's cross-party support <coughs> for a windfall tax, a one-off windfall tax. And um, Commonwealth think tanks show that actually doing that would not impact pensioners' pension points because only I think 0.2% um, of pension pots are invested in energy and gas companies. A windfall time, Win William Hay came out in favour of it, has cross-party support. I think that could have really helped people, I think, that to, to a tune of about £900 in the year. Um, VAT, one-off, again, could have been looked at. Um, I think... I have sympathy with what the government's doing. It's stabilising the economy. Jobs are clearly important. But I'm afraid on this issue it hits the medium. It doesn't hit those who are really, really struggling. And unfortunately, it's events. You've had you've had people coming out of COVID, just about, you know, using up their savings, just about managing to keep their jobs if they have them. And now the inflation, it's hitting everyone. Mm. So I'd like to see more. And uh, uh, Richard, just to, just to follow up on that, the fact that Boris Johnson afterwards did say, and we're going to have measures to do with cost of living, shows that in hindsight, it should have been there very much at the outset. What I'd, what I'd just say to that is that obviously there's some measures coming in. I've already said the national insurance uh, cut coming in in July. We've had the um, uh, universal credit. Do, do, uh, but do, 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 do you recognise, though, that there will have to be more, I, I think particularly in the budget? I'm, 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 I'm absolutely sure that at the back end of the year, if we're in a similar situation with Ukraine, there is a, there is a, there is a possibility that the entire situation in Ukraine could be in some way be resolved. I don't think that's likely, but I think there's a possibility at some point that that, that conflict will end. When that ends, then there will see a, a huge shift in in some of the price rises that we've seen. But Richard, sorry, um, Simon Clark rightly did a very good interview uh, uh, a day or so ago. He talked about you he's know, the chief secretary yeah, to the treasury. We're going to have we're going to have you know a lot more measures put in in the autumn. That's good and well. It's probably the right time under normal circumstances, but some families are not going to make it make it to them. They're really struggling. Okay, Christian Wakeford. Um, going back to the initial question, what's in the Queen's speech? In short, nothing. Um, there, there's a lot to talk about growth. There's a lot of talk about the cost of living. However, there's no actual solutions to, to 
any part of it. Uh, what we've seen is slowed growth. What we've seen is uh, the uh, employment figures. Yeah, but a few months ago, you would have been arguing that we have one of the highest growth rates in, in the G7, and now you're saying we have slow growth. Oh, from, from, from last year, it was, con con considering where we were the year before because of you know, the, the impact of COVID. Uh, but when you extrapolate that across the, uh, the, the period of the last 10 years or so, it's actually been very low growth. Uh, and obviously low growth has impact on wages and there's only, only so much that's been done during that time. But when we're talking about what's being done, yes, there's been the £150 rebate, but what's coming down in a couple of months' time, you know, yes, a lot of people are getting um, £200, but that's a loan. Uh, so everyone going on and saying, well, it's not, well, it is. You're, you're being gifted £200 and you have to pay it back. Um, but what we're seeing, again, you know, we, we're having talk about the uh, national insurance threshold being cut. You know, for many people, we're seeing a national insurance rise uh, as of just, just a month ago. So for those who were just about managing before, you know, there's a lot of people who are really struggling. And, you know, the, the one slight thing I'll, I'll disagree with um, all the friendly is it's not even a case of having to choose between heating and eating. Some people can't afford one of the two, let alone having to make a choice. Uh, as to which one to do and you know certainly when I've been knocking on doors uh, recently and, and Richard might have had it because he was in Berry as well um, you know there's a lot of fear out there and there's no help coming whatsoever you know the Queen's speech today could have included a reference to an emergency budget it could have included a reference to a windfall tax you know the government's chose not to yes we're talking about doing something in in uh, in the autumn but by then it's far too late you know I mean, what are the uh, the pensioners doing when they have to go to the market all day just to stay warm or you know call from a couple of weeks ago elsie who goes on the bus all day just to say what help is being given to them or, or those on benefits um like, like the caller uh, we're, we're talking about but there's absolutely no help but I, sitting here now, I, apart from the windfall tax, I can't think of what Labour are promising to do to help people like that. And I accept it's the role of the opposition to criticise the government, but surely you have to provide a meaningful alternative. Well, I mean, the, the windfall tax already is uh, proposing a £600 uh, benefit for, for all households. So when the it's average... for all households, is it, Christian? Or is that new policy? Oh, they, <laughs> come on, Richard. I, I, I think we, we all know the details so far is uh, an average of six hundred pounds uh, kind of help per, per household. But when we've seen uh, everything that's come forward, yes, most fuel bills have gone up uh, by about seven hundred pounds. So it still doesn't address everything, but goes a damn sight closer to what's being offered by the government so far. Um, but is there more that can be done <coughs> potentially? And some of that will be okay. via VAT. Emily, I think that it's important to put some context to this, it is hardly surprising that currently we're all suffering from inflation, which is cost, which is cutting our disposable income, is cutting our quality of life. In many ways, our standard of living is being uh, pressurised like we haven't seen for many, many years. But this is something that isn't unique to the UK. It's something that's happening across the Western world and it's hardly surprising considering the past two years and the amount of money that has been pumped into the economy while people have been paid to stay at home. So we are suffering from inflation that has come as a result of that. Yes, the crisis in Ukraine has contributed. Yes, energy prices have too, but the amount of money that also has been pumped into the economy has been and the Bank of England has failed to keep inflation at its target at 2%. Yes, I would argue that the Chancellor has also failed to keep that under wraps at the same time. In terms of the cost of living in the Queen's speech, no, there wasn't really anything in there that would address the cost of living. As you said, it's not a budget, but I think some things could have been done. I was very disappointed that the planning bill was axed, scrapped, and that there have only been minor and trivial amendments to planning reforms put forward. That's one of those things that could really bring down the cost of living in the medium to long term. Uh, you know, people are suffering from rents. We know in the capital that rents have gone up 14% in the last year. Of course, another knock-on effect of the pandemic Pandemic as well as just generally the supply not being there to meet demand. Um, we also looked at, there was nothing in there about childcare. That's one of the areas where people really are suffering. You know, for some families, it doesn't make sense for the person who's looking after the children primarily to even go back to work because the costs outweigh the salary that you're going to earn going back to work, which isn't great for women as well in the labour market. And it's got not great for our productivity as a country. Um, I, of course, would love to see more tax uh, 
um, uh, tax cuts going forward. Say, you're, I'm you're, hoping. You're, you're, I'm hoping. Surprising me there. I'm hoping that that will come later. We've heard whispers that the prime minister is going to sort of, you know, have yeah, take the, some rabbit I, out. Well, there I just hang, just hang on a second because I mean the law, the basic laws of economics don't change. You can't have tax cuts and then say yes, and we need to spend more on X, Y, and Z uh, unless you're going to dra- rapidly increase borrowing yet again. Which is it? Well, I would argue that perhaps we need to be looking at ways in which we would cut public spending. I'm not one of those people who Where? denies a cut-offs. Well, uh, trade-offs. Well, for example, I believe, and I know a lot of people would also share this opinion, that our civil service is very much bloated and that perhaps there yeah. is space Sa- to... Save a few hundred million pounds. HS2, let's go for that, scrap that. I don't think that's serving and I don't think it's going to uh, level up the country either. We can look to many areas where we could cut public spending, but I do think that the government probably should have prioritised keeping welfare payments in line with inflation. I think when you've got inflation at, what, 7% at the moment and welfare payments have only gone up 3%, I believe, that doesn't seem on. Um, So, you know, there are trade-offs. Richard, you you gave a lot of examples of things that the government is doing or planning to do, but very few of those are having a direct impact with people at the moment. There are things that could be done that would. For example, um, if you want to target help at the poorest in society, you could reinstate the £20 uplift on universal credit. That would have a real impact for people now, wouldn't it? Well, that's that's why I've said exactly the cutting the actual withdrawal rate on universal credit by 8% from 63 to 55 is actually going to have a massive impact. But that only works if you're in work. What, what if you're not? And universal credit's your only and And the other thing that... And, and what's helping people now is £150 per family, which is going into pockets. Now, I just but, want to, but that, well, I, that was I, a fair I, point I, that Christian made there, wasn't it? I just want to pick up on Christian's point now. Because Labour said... So the Labour policy is a windfall tax. That's, Labour have said that will raise £1.2 billion. Pounds, OK? Uh, there are 28 million households in the UK. That's £40 pounds per household. Christian says an average of £600 pounds per household. It's just a lie. It's just not true. It's a, it's a 15th well, it's, it's, of what he's it's, saying. It's not a lie, though. You know when 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 there were 28 the million in the first three months 20, of each year there were 26 billion pounds in profit Yep. But there's and, quite and, a and, lot and, more that and, can and, be and that's six hundred pounds. To be fair to Christian, that six hundred pound figure seems to be the figure that is quoted. I mean, I suppose it depends how much the windfall tax actually is, but well, that's the that's let, the figure let, that let, everyone's in, quoted. In fairness, in fairness and Labour have said it'll be one. It'll be ten percent more on the uh, tax on North Sea companies. Um, already, uh, North Sea oil companies pay 40% corporation tax rather than 19%. Um, so that's the difference. So Labour is saying, we'd have a, an extra, just on the North Sea oil companies, they pay an extra 10%. Mm. That's the actual Labour But policy. they seem to be quite happy with the prospect of it. But, but Shell made 7.3 billion and, profit and, in the, yeah, and the year before. And, and, yeah. Yeah. But, it's not all from the North, no. but it, the key thing is it's not all from the North Sea. And Labour's own figures the, from Labour at the time said it would be £1.2 billion. Pounds. There are almost 30 million households in the UK. If you divide £1.2 billion okay. by 30 million, you end up with just over 40 pounds right, let's of households. Right, let's just hear from Martin, who asked the original question. You sparked real debate here, Martin. What's your view? Well, I agree with you, Ian. I just think uh, to get through the cost of living, I, like, I, obviously I'm on benefits at the moment, and mm. just any sort of guys, you know, I mean, if it was at, even if it was 10 or £20 a, a week again, just, just to get us through it, you know what I mean? I live in a mm. caravan, mm. and in, in winter in this caravan, it's terrible. And mm. it's, it's, it's like today, Ian, I, I, I'm not, I love the Queen, but when I see all that money being spent on the state open in a parliament and I think about people not eating and having eat, eating as well and yeah I, I feel I mean I mean I know I know the Queen brings money in with all this with um, functions and things like that but you know I mean people people are proper struggling and yeah we're, we're well, it's an, inter- it's an interesting point. We're going to be talking about the Queen and Prince Charles after nine o'clock, so stay listening for that, Martin. Thank you very much indeed for your call. Uh, we'll come to more of your calls in a moment. 0345 6060 973. It's 19 minutes past eight. This is LBC. Uh-
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. It's 20 past eight on LBC. You're listening to or watching Cross Question. If you've never watched us before, switch on Global Player, download the app, and you can see us all in glorious technicolour if you really want to. Uh, Christian Wakeford is here, Labour MP for Bury South, Sarah Saidi, lawyer and co-founder of Action for Afghanistan. I guess that does what it says on the tin. Indeed. Tell us a little more. Um, when um, the US exited Kabul, we got together a whole group of people from humanitarian experts to lawyers to political people to MOD and we just first of all try to get people on priority list to get them out of the country um, then had to fundraise to get some people out of the country and then continue to work with um, you know ministers on raising awareness of the humanitarian situation how we can get money given the Taliban's there um, you know and, and security issues so we, we've kept at it it's a it's it is almost a job actually but it's um, they still need us and the the situation for women is horrendous. Mm. Um, we have Emily Carver with us, Head of Media at the Institute of Economic Affairs and a Conservative Home columnist, and Richard Holden, Conservative MP for North West Durham. Um, Daisy in Streatham has sent in a text saying, um, was there anything today for young people didn't feel like it? Which is exactly what we were talking about in the break there. Um, Emily, you, were, you have strong views on that. Well, I was just going to say that the uh, Conservative Party have decided to... Uh, their ban on buy one get one free so hopefully that's a slight is that, uh, damage is that relevant to young people cost of living. no but perhaps young people are more like no they're not probably actually it's, <laughs> it's just a general i don't think there was anything particularly for young people unless you think the brexit freedoms bill might be good in terms of uh, making it easier for the government to axe useless regulation that we've oh, imported from them. the eu maybe that's a bit of a stretch i'm not sure that's for young people i think for housing I was disappointed that the reforms aren't going far enough. I know Michael Gove has taken a lot of heat over this from his MPs, his colleagues who represent constituencies where they have lots of noisy NIMBYs, lots of people with vested interests who don't want to see uh, big developments going up. But, you know, if you're going to have, you know, the population growing at the speed it is currently, you need to house people somewhere. So I think the government is slightly in denial about that. But I think that's also shared by the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats and all sorts. It seems like a whole political class are in a little bit of denial about the housing crisis. And you know what? 80% of young people think that capitalism is to blame for the housing crisis. So you can just see how that would play out in future elections when anyone under 40 is certainly not going to move to the Conservative Party, I don't think. So I would have liked to see more for young people, but I think generally across the whole, it was a little bit lacklustre as a Queen's speech. Okay, Sarah? Um, there wasn't enough for young people. I mean, I think uh, the, the measures coming out of the levelling up department were probably some of the more exciting, such as the infrastructure levy. Um, it, there was a little bit around, um, you know, the um, on, on housing rents, but they're doing nothing about housing supply. Absolutely nothing at the moment. Um, and, you know, unless we build houses to meet demand, you know, it just won't be affordable for young people. And in the capital and in other large cities, you've got increasingly high rents now, plus the cost of living. So young people are trapped you know, they can barely save month to month and they simply can't afford a house. So I, I, I don't think there was enough on that at all. Christian? Probably not a lot more to, to add. I mean, the, the absence of any reference of planning affordable or social housing uh, was depressing. Um, there was reference to a schools bill, but again, not a massive uh, amount of uh, detail behind it. But again, what we were discussing during the break of, of childcare, and for young families, two of the biggest concerns you've got are housing and childcare. And there was a complete absence of, of any mention of, of either of those. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm quite fortunate. My, my daughter's you now leaving childcare and going into primary school this year. Um, but it shouldn't be a case of you're, you're literally waiting for your child to reach an age as a, as a cost-saving benefit. You know, there, there should be a way to actually help you uh, to, to promote families, for one, but actually to, to get, as uh, as we were discussing earlier, you know, productivity or people back into work without thinking, well, if if I'm not working, you know, we're saving a, a huge amount on childcare. So that, that to me, would be the, the one big one that, that could be changed quickly. But again, you know, there's been a choice not to do anything about it. What, why should I subsidise your childcare? 
well, sure, surely we want many more people in work. Um, surely we want a thriving future of the, the, uh, the country. It, it's not just in, investing in childcare, it's investing in the future of the country. I think we're looking uh, at And I would it. hope most people would, would, uh, would take that. I mean, you could bounce back and say, why should I invest in the health service if I'm not ill? You, you might be. Uh, I, I say that because I, I can hear people screaming at their radio, which is I'm not using myself as an example, but there are a lot of people who think, well, you make a choice to have a child, that surely it's incumbent on you as a parent to make sure that your childcare arrangements are feasible and it shouldn't be for the taxpayer to subsidise those. Oh, what, I mean, what if your circumstances change? I mean, you plan for a child, you were both in employment, but something changes and all of a sudden one parent isn't mm. in employment. What happens then? Well, that's a different scenario, isn't it? Because th then you could argue, well, that, that is what the state is there for, to help you in times of difficulty. It's not there to provide universal childcare benefits. Well, I, I, again, I, I think what, one of the things we should be most proud of, uh, if it's done right, is you know, investing in our children's future. You know, if anything, I think we, we need to do a, a lot more. I mean, 30 hours is great when a child reaches the age of three, but up until that point, you know, these, these are the most developmental ages of any child. That's where we need to be putting more investment in to actually help young parents, uh, one, learn more about parenting themselves, but also to allow that child to develop as much as they can do. Because if it's not got right at that say, it's a much more expensive intervention later on in, okay. in a child's educational career. Richard Holden. Um, well, I think one of the biggest things that the government's doing is finally filling one of the manifesto commitments around ending uh, Section 21 evictions, which is no-fault evictions. Uh, and there's so many young people. I was until just a couple of years ago. Um, I rented all the way through my 20s and right into my mid-30s. And uh, that, those, the costs which are associated, actually, with that and having to move house are quite substantial as well. So I think that's a, that's a positive change. Um, I'd also say that one of the biggest... The things that I get on the doorstep in my constituency, it's something I did pick up when I was in um, Bury as well, was uh, people wanting uh, safer streets. Uh, and there's a lot in the uh, Queen's speech about uh, making our streets safer. And actually, young people are also tend to be, uh, very heavily actually, a disproportionately victims of crime. So anything which can be done in that direction, I think, is also uh, helpful. But I think... Like the, more investment into councils for youth services. And I think the broadest uh, thing that we can do um, overall for young people is to ensure we've got a strong and robust economy. And I think that's what the, what the government's really pushing on uh, overall. And I think the... Uh, uh, particularly for young people wanting to get into work, the fact that we've got more job, more more people in uh, in, on, in uh, work uh, in uh, on payrolls at the moment, half a million more than before the pandemic, is really good news, and that's what we've got to concentrate on because uh, the the best thing we can possibly do for young people is to ensure that they've got a, a good, well-paid job, and uh, and that's certainly a situation which is moving in the right direction in my constituency, and I know increasingly across the country. Um, there is a draft mental health bill, and it is <coughs> Mental Health Awareness Week this week. Um, it says it's designed to overhaul the mental health system in England and Wales. Well, I, I suspect we're probably all in agreement that that is a good thing. Do we have any details on how that's going to work? Um, I, I've not seen any details of this draft mental health bill so far, but I think the fact that it's something that I think will receive cross, broad cross-party support um, is very important because there has... And it's something that's been talked about for a long time, is mental health not getting... Uh, getting the uh, getting the, the, the uh, focus that it needs. It's something that's an issue in my constituency, Child and Adult Mental and Mental Health Services. I'm sure Christian's had similar cases in, in his area, but it's definitely something that needs to be properly looked at, especially with the impact that can have on learning in schools of young people. <clears throat> um, Ian says a text, uh, you really are a wretched, horrible Tory. What about <laughs> gay conversion? Nothing to say about that, have you? Well, there is, the bill has been announced the in the Queen's been, speech, hasn't it? has been announced in the Queen's speech. Um, what about the trans community? Uh, well... It's much more complicated, but, I think. To be, to, Maybe we'll get a question on that later because we are coming up to the news. But um, somebody else says, we subsidise childcare to help parents raise future taxpayers who will fund older generation state <laughs> pensions, surely. I thought you meant older, older generation state pensions like yours, Ian. That's what you really meant, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, That's time for a break. This is what happens when you play devil's advocate, isn't it? But yeah. there we go. Uh, keep your calls coming, 0345 6060 973. You're listening to Cross Question on LBC. I'm Ian Dale, it's half past eight. And the news headlines with Serena Farrow. Charities and opposition politicians have criticised the government for failing to promise more support for those struggling with the cost of living crisis in today's Queen's speech. Boris Johnson's revealed plans to create a high-wage, high-skill economy. 
Prince William has given a deeply personal tribute as he attended the opening of a public memorial for those killed in the Manchester Arena attack in 2017. He told bereaved families that as someone who lives with his own grief, he understands the importance of remembrance. And Elon Musk says he'd reverse Twitter's ban on Donald Trump. The former US president was permanently suspended from the social media platform shortly after the riot on the US Capitol in 2021. LBC weather, cool and breezy with showers, particularly in the north tonight, cloudy with patchy rain in the south and a low of 7 degrees. This is LBC. Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. Well, we've had an excellent discussion so far. Let's hope the second half hour lives up to the quality of the first. I'm sure it will. It's 8.32. Christian Wakeford is here, Labour MP for Bury South. Sarah Zaidi is a lawyer and co-founder of Action for Afghanistan. Emily Carver is head of media at the Institute of Economic Affairs and a columnist on Conservative Home. And Richard Holden is the Conservative MP for North West Durham. Now, Richard, you've had an interesting um, few days, given you were the MP to uh, write to Durham Police about Keir Starmer. Given that they've now started this investigation, do you feel completely vindicated or do you think maybe it's not necessarily always a good thing for politicians to call for other politicians to be investigated? Well, I just I, I just thought at the time that it was right that the same stand, the leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer, was held to the same standards as the Prime Minister. I'm glad that the police are looking at it now, but given it's under police investigation, I think it would be inappropriate for me to comment much further on that. OK. Well, you might have a question on it. You might, we, we might have to get you to comment further on it. But, um, but what's it been like being at the, the kind of centre of the media storm on this? Uh, well, I, I mean, so social media has not been particularly kind to you, it has to be said. Uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> saying, the, uh, uh, the, the inbox has been, uh, has, 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 uh, has been dealt with uh, over the last few days. Um, no, it's, uh, look, I, just, I, I genuinely think it was a case of... Um, both the Prime Minister and the man who aspires to be Prime Minister just have to be held to the same uh, level of accountability. I think that's basically where the British public are. I think that's where Keir Starmer would have, would have said when he was Director of Public Prosecutions, people should be treated equally. And, uh, um, and now there's a police uh, investigation. I think uh, we'll just have to see what happens next. Fair enough, isn't it, Christian? Well, I, I, I think there's one thing. Uh, I think when we see uh, political interference in the police, it's a very slippy slope is what, to where things can get to. But I, I think there's a massive contextual difference uh, between where Keir was uh, for this issue and where the Prime Minister's been. Uh, obviously, I've been on the show previously saying how uh, there's a difference between right and wrong and what's happened in number 10 is clearly wrong. Uh, but that wasn't just one issue. That was an entire cultural issue. What, what we've seen with Keir is... You know, a, a long you know, working day, it's the middle of a by-election and you know, I've worked on elections with Richard before um, and you don't stop... Halcyon days. Um, indeed. Um, <laughs> very, very pleasurable memories. Um, but you, you, you don't stop work um, just because the, the clock hits a certain hour. You carry on until all the work's done uh, so you can crack on in the morning. But can you hand on heart say that if Rishi Sunak deserved a fine for appearing for two minutes at something that he assumed was a work meeting, that Keir Starmer, um, his, if there is a transgression, 
that it, it was uh, sort of less worse than that. Oh, I think Keir is very clear, as is the Labour Party, that you know they are very confident that no rules were broken whatsoever. Keir, walk, uh, Keir Rishi walked into the cabinet room, saw something that was clearly against the rules, and he did have a choice. He could have walked away and tur turned around, <clears throat> uh, but he chose not to do so. Uh, when Richard's talking about the same standards, it's very clear that actually Keir you know, holds himself to higher standards. That's just, just he's already said that he'd resign if he was... To fine, fine, uh, final he question. Did, he did say, in fairness, yeah, he did, Keir actually said, when he's holding himself to higher standards, that resign, people should be resigned if they go under investigation, uh, which has changed his position on that. So, actually... I don't understand what standard is. Really oh, I, I mean, Rich, Richard, you yourself in February said that actually, if uh, someone was to be found guilty, uh, they should face the full consequences, uh, whether that's Absolutely. to be fined, that's uh, right. to resign, or to be sacked. Uh, so, what's doing, changed with the prime minister? So the prime minister has been fined and has apologised to the house. What the the difference is? So, it, so he shouldn't resign just, because just he's been found guilty. Just a second. Did, the prime minister has paid the price and has uh, paid the fine and apologised to the house. The difference in what Keir Starmer did is exactly with your words, Christian. He set himself a different standard. He said that if people are under investigation, that the Prime Minister should resign. I, and he said this, and, he, and he's been equally critical of Rishi Sunak as well. I don't, he's now changing his position. Um, what, all well, the I'm Prime Minister is still under investigation now, well, so uh, should, uh, he, should he resign now? Uh, uh, I don't, I'm not Keir Starmer. I didn't, I didn't make that. That's what Keir Starmer said. That's what Keir Starmer said. He won't stick to his own, he won't stick to what he holds other people accountable for. And, and that's the real thing here. Uh, he's, 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 he said he'll resign if he's been found guilty. It's it's not the, but it's very different. No, no, Richard. it's not. It, it's how is it? What the, the the rub here is that Keir Starmer thought he you know has gone uh, month after month after month. Uh, the three big debates just before we broke up for recess were all on this because the late and I, I was in York you know, as as you well know I was in buried during the campaign. It was all over the Labour literature. This was what they were concentrating on on the doorsteps in Bury in the cross the local elections. And Keir Starmer said that the Prime Minister or anybody else should be res resign if they're under investigation. And then you turned on that yesterday, yeah, it, and you can't answer it, why. That, it, it was on the literature. Answer. And I know because I was putting that literature at myself, what, uh, so, and it was so on the why, literature why did, because so it was change? important. Yeah, I think back to. So why does it change? I think, has changed I think back to one of my best so friends who went through over twenty chemotherapy sessions alone. You know, all her radiotherapy sessions alone because she knew the rules. She knew the rules applied to her, and she understood them. The prime minister clearly didn't. Okay, so I, Starmer's changes. I'm, I'm going to bring you to. I'm going to bring you to in on this yeah. in just one second. But just finally, Richard, if Keir Starmer is fined and he resigns, that puts enormous pressure on the prime minister to follow suit, doesn't it? Because otherwise. Um, I mean, Keir Starmer will emerge with this smelling of roses, even if he has had to resign his job. Uh, I, 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 as I said, I don't want to speculate on ongoing police investigation, what's going to happen. However, I'll Keir be Starmer... happy to before an investigation. Keir, Keir Starmer, well, somebody had, to, somebody had to sort of push it and try and, and, and get to a situation where people are treated equally across the country, because it was very different, Christian, uh, as you well know, the different... Uh, what, what, what the police right. said... I, I can, Met, I can feel said, the two non-politicians yeah. on this panel yeah. becoming increasingly frustrated we, at this discussion. We, Ian, Sarah. we have spent more heated time talking about Beergate and Partygate and Pizzagate or whatever gate the latest things the politicians are doing badly. Because that's what it is, the scale of badness Dominator now. Gate. Dominator Gate. Whatever. <laughs> We've spent more time on this form, yeah. than cost of living, mm. actually. <laughs> And the public are sick to death of this. What this is doing is eroding politics, uh, the trust in politicians, because clearly uh, quite a few of them and their advisors did not understand the rules. They were quite clear. Mm. I, I, have, I have two people very close to me who've got two cro who are have very ill. So within a 14-month period, I only had one outside dinner outside my bubble. I know a lot of people and a lot, you know, who lost loved ones, who followed the rules. This just looks bad on, I'm afraid, the whole political class. Um, Emily, very quick word, and then we'll move on. I would just say, uh, you know, I think if this whole rigmarole has to persist, I think that at least cons there should be consistency when it comes to how the law is applied. But I do think it's just so boring for yeah. most people now. It's not of interest. All right, let's move I don't on. care. The rules, need to be. <laughs> the, the rules were wrong to begin with. They were totally inconsistent and contradictory and they should never have existed right. in my view. Robbie in Chancellor has been patiently waiting. Robbie, what's your question please? Hi. Good evening all. Um, do you think that the media, especially major newspapers, have too much influence on our politics? Do we think that the media, particularly newspapers, his words, not mine, have too much influence on our politics and political system? Um, 
Sarah? It depends what side of the political uh, sphere you fall on. I mean, if you talk to some people, they don't like the Daily Mail. If you talk to another person, they can't stand the Guardian. I think I think there's intense polarisation today. Um, and I think um, the bubbles that we live in on social media, particularly Twitter, accentuate that, or Facebook. It accentuates your bubble. Um, but what I would say, as someone who's been quite sick of Partygate and Pizzagate, is that... The, the news the news media gets stuck on one thing yeah. and there's barely any oxygen for other issues that matter I mean I clearly represent an organization called action for Afghanistan you know we it's been impossible to raise awareness of the you know vulnerable people in Afghanistan the era- the erasure of women's rights you know you can't get any oxygen on you know uh, even on cost of living it's all about the headline of the day uh, pursued relentlessly Emily Yeah, I think that's true. And it's the nature of our media landscape is that you need to get clicks in order to be able Mm -hmm. to survive Mm -hmm. and to be profitable and to keep people in business. And if you don't get clicks and you don't follow what you perceive to be the most important story or the most click-worthy story, then you're not going to be able to keep going. by saying that, you've just guaranteed you won't be getting a viral video out of that. (laughs) (laughs) But I do do think that a journalist... I think that there is a problem. I think we saw Mm. today or yesterday that something like 80% of people in the media have are now going into journalism now went to Oxbridge or private school or whatever and we don't seem to have that system of people going into local not journalism gui- not guilty your honour g- going into local journalism <laughs> it, it you know as an apprentice not necessarily having even gone to university learning your trade and then moving up that way we closing down that. though now yeah, you they're... spend tens of thousands of pounds on master degrees that are you know that you buy, I don't know, at the different universities that sell them to you and everyone seems to follow the same path. So I think that's a shame. I wish there was more diversity in our media. I think some people feel like the Overton window is shut on them and they can't have their voice heard. And it is a bit of a group mentality to break into, a little bit cliquey and that sort of thing. Um, Whether the media has too much impact on politics, I think that's just the way of the world and people as individuals can decide who they listen to and what they believe. See, I think, um, Christian, that newspapers have far less influence on our politics than they did even 10 years ago. Mm. Uh, No, I I agree. I I think on the back of uh, Leveson, on the back of all the phone hacking uh, scandals, I think the influence, the impact on not just politics, but you know the, the way we, we see the media has changed drastically uh, during that time. Uh, what we've seen is the rise of alt media uh, for, for, for a lot of um, kind of different ways to, to view the news. And you know, that, uh, depending on, on your viewpoint, can be a good thing. It yeah. can be a bad thing, um, just like, like a lot of the, the smaller social media sites. Um, what I do think is it will address politics as much as individuals want it to. If you want to read from a varied source, and I I think back to actually my my degree where the recommendation was read one tabloid and one broadsheet and compare what the actual coverage is between the two to try and get a a more kind of reasoned background. But again, outside the Westminster... So you used to read The Telegraph and The Sun, now you read The Guardian and The Mirror. Uh, what did I, read? <laughs> I I think it was the Times and the Sun. Um, but yeah, again, outside. Now? Um, I, I tried to re- re- read Morning all the papers. Star, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll oh, do that in some way. Yeah. Just, just <laughs> as an aside. Well, that's how, a joke. How, which how, I love for diversity. How, how difficult, Christian, has it been to adapt? Because you, you, you spent a long time as a Conservative supporter, you were a Conservative MP, that you've defected to Labour. You can't just flip overnight in terms of your thought process and your habits and sort of... And, and have you found it awkward to make that adaptation? Well, no, because it, it didn't happen overnight. I, I didn't wake up one day and go, today I'm going to be a Labour MP. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it was a long process. And you know, you know, for one, it was a lot of sleepless nights and internal questioning and uh, and what that meant on an ideological, a, a personal, a friendship basis. Mm. Um, but in terms of like the, the habits, you know, I I read a lot of different uh, papers before. You know, you know I, I still read Con Home now. I, I also read Labour List um, because actually the more knowledge you have, the the better individual it makes you, the better politician it makes you. And how have your former colleagues reacted to you? I mean, do you, do they still talk to well, you? I, or is I, it, is I went to rugby hostility? with Richard in, uh, in is, February. Yeah. Um, I've got many friends who will openly give me a hug. Um, <laughs> uh, in the middle you of, in the middle of Paul Coy's house. Um, <laughs> 
I, I think the overall consensus. Well, that's interesting because I don't think that if, mm. if somebody, I know one or two people who did defect. I mean, many many years ago, and they found it a profoundly upsetting experience because they were shunned. And you 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 haven't found that. The, there is some shunning, and you know, I'm I've lost one of the best men from my wedding over this. Really, I've lost. Well, he was know, he was he wasn't a good friend. I've though. lost friendships so which are 15, 16 years in, in the making. Um, so for for a lot of that kind of concept of, of you've you've done it to save your own neck. Mm. Well, you know, for me, you know, I, I hold friendship above family because friendship yeah. is the family you choose. But I knew this was going to have a profound impact. I, I knew it was a serious decision. Um, I think the overall consensus so far is, I don't agree with you, mm. but you're a friend. I'm mm. just making sure you're okay. But for- is, is that is that your attitude? Uh, my attitude, Christian, is that you know um, I'll treat him as the same as I did before. But obviously, you know I'll hold him to task the on, same. His, uh, <laughs> on his new on his, on his new leader and the policies he's now uh, yeah. pursuing. Well, you did maybe it before, so I view, <laughs> I view it as a political. I view it as a political difference. That's and 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 uh, then that's how I view it. it. It does degrade my trust in politics a little bit. Really? That one would be able to be a Conservative MP on one day, and be voted in by their constituents on that basis, and then suddenly become a socialist. I can understand them. I, 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 personally, I find that difficult to understand. Well, I, I, mean, I was a very socially liberal centrist yeah. before. I, I wasn't just elected by Conservative voters. Now, I sure, got an electorate of 78,000 people that I still represent. Um, but, the, but the two main parties have had such differences, so particularly post-Brexit, that, you know, you saw a whole tranche of Conservative MPs, like, you know, Philip Lee cross the floor, some not not stand again. Mm. You know, Corbynites versus so the Blairites. You know, there's such extreme variances that I think it's... I can understand why somebody, particularly around the centre ground of their party, would shift one way. Um, Richard it, it hasn't may, had a chance trust, to answer the question yet, which it. let me... Yeah. Uh, I've been a very bad chairman and let us <laughs> veer off. And I thought it was just interesting to hear Christian's experience. Um, Robbie's question was, do you think the media, particularly newspapers, have too much influence on our political system? I mean, you, you spent a lot of time working in communications for the Conservative Party, dealing with the media all the time, so you've probably got a unique perspective on uh, this. Well, I, um, so I, I was, uh, I'd probably take the line that you took, actually, in, which is that they've got much less influence than they once had. Um, I actually think they can be quite useful, even... Um, papers you might disagree with for example you know the mail did a massive campaign over Stephen Lawrence yeah. and getting uh, justice uh, for those you know and now you know, uh, Christian and I might disagree over the Mail's coverage over the last uh, week or two, but there are, there have been s- big stuff that they've done. Uh, I've worked with the media on uh, all sorts of campaigns, from axing the motorhome tax in my constituency to, on a totally different level, banning virginity testing and hymenoplasty, which happened mm. in the health and care bill. Mm. So there's so, and, and some of that is only brought to attention if you work with the media, because otherwise people don't mm. know. Oh, about we've it. seen Sean Linton with the sodium vaporate scandal. You know that yeah. came to light in the Sunday Times a couple of weeks ago. Mm. And, uh, you know, one of my constituents is one of the lead campaigners. So, I mean, actually quoting the Sunday Times in, in PMQs. But, you know, sometimes we need the press to shine a light on these. Well, that, that, Robbie, let's come back to you. That is interesting, isn't it? What, what Richard and uh, Christian have both agreed on there, that um, to do good, sometimes you actually do need newspapers to help. Yeah, and I, I don't know whether to be relieved or frustrated by the, the consensus. <laughs> um, I think I was expecting a oh, totally no. <laughs> different discussion just based on the fact, if, if you indulge me, the fact that I feel, not newspapers specifically, but the media, and I suppose particularly given the readership of the Daily Mail and the Sun, almost indirectly seem to pick our leaders. And I'm thinking way back to being 10 years old and hearing this, this big news that the Sun supported Tony Blair and Labour at that point, bucking a trend. And it just feels a little bit sinister to me, but perhaps I'm thinking too much or spending too much time on Twitter. Uh, you, you obviously are. Um, and that's a very bad thing. And I know from personal experience it's a bad thing. Uh, Robbie, thanks for your call. We'll come to more of your calls in a second. It's 8.49. This is LBC.
Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 8.52 on LBC. Christian Wakeford, Sarah Saidi, Emily Carver and Richard Holden with us taking your calls and texts. Jessica in Hartlepool has texted this. The Taliban have now brought in a burqa mandate for women in Afghanistan. They're also still shutting girls out of school. Could anyone on your panel explain to me how did we let this happen? I think that's a sentiment that a lot of people will have a lot of sympathy with. Uh, Zeri, you're the expert. It's... B, it was a car crash in the making. You knew it the moment the US uh, began its countdown to withdraw um, our group. And by the way, I've, I've, I've done about 15 years of work on humanitarian human rights. I've specialised in, 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 in vulnerable communities, women, young people, eth ethnic and religious minorities. Um, so our group, uh, for example, we knew uh, under the Taliban women would be literally put back into a human prison. Um, the first thing we did is we got um, Sophie Sophie Walker, Catherine Mulhern and myself put together a petition. It got almost 500,000 signatures, change.org, um, to try and convince the government to prioritise women and girls in its priority lists. Um, and we, people, the, the, our sort of volunteer group of about 30, 40 people did not sleep for weeks trying to get people out. From Operation Pitting, after you take out um, uh, those who worked for us, um, British staff, only 500 people who came in Operation Pitting were vulnerable people, and that included women and girls. And often when you, when you have these figures, you have to divide by five because it includes families. So hardly any women came out. Um, <coughs> and so the first thing that didn't happen is that obviously, and it's not the UK's fault, uh, the, the Qatar talks uh, did not include women in, 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 in the conversations. They, you know, it was it was completely one-sided. There were not enough um, provisions for women's rights um, put and forward. This is when Donald Trump came to this, yeah, initially absolutely. came to the agreement with the Taliban yeah. and set a date um, I think it was for May, wasn't it? 20, that was that was 20. that was the sentence for women right there because you knew what would follow. They had a carte blanche to come back in. They simply was they simply <coughs> was not enough. But in every area of public and private life now, women and young girls have no future in Afghanistan. Yeah. One by one, they cannot work. They cannot go to school. They have to be accompanied. They have to wear their burqa. They they do you know they can't go to parks on their own. They, um, it's, they, they can't go to mosques now. There's nothing virtually, there's nothing they can do. And the biggest issue for us trying to get women out is that they couldn't even travel out to get them out of the country. And we were representing people, I mean, on the, on the last day we were trying to get out the chief prosecutor to the Taliban. You know, there, there, was, there were women that, 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 that stood up when we said we're going to go into the country, the allies, we're going to, you know, fight for a better Afghanistan, help build a better Afghanistan. And these women signed up and we all so let them down. If, if a woman in Afghanistan now decides that she's had enough, she wants to leave, I mean, can that happen? It's almost, it's, it's, it's almost impossible. It's, you know, there... To be fair to the FCDO, they have an excellent minister in Lord Ahmed. I'm talking to him quite regularly on women's rights. He is doing a great job because unfortunately, now that we're out, there's we are reliant on often neighboring countries. Mm. Qatar and Pakistan mm. have got a lot of influence and Muslim countries in general um, who, who may not themselves place women's rights and women's equality at the highest level. So what the government needs to do, uh, you know, and, and Canada with its feminist foreign policies pursuing this, any negotiation with the Taliban around humanitarian aid has to put women at the forefront. And uh, Lord Am has been looking at creating sort of a, a women's leadership group to try and get these issues out. But I'd love to hear from the panel because, you know, I need your, you know, I need support and your voices to try and keep doing this. Well, let's go to Christian before he expires. He's, he's got a chest infection, just to explain the coughing. Uh, it's a, a recovered chest, chest infection, but still the cough. Um, again, I'll reiterate what I said when I came on the show in December. When it comes to Operation Pitting, the one person who stood up uh, above all else with this, with, with the way he tackled the entire crisis, was Ben Wallace. He was brilliant. Um, so I, I'll, I'll pay tribute to him again for this. However, what we've seen as soon as we pulled out was a complete lack of safe routes um, for everything we're seeing now with the, the blue burkas going back to um, how the Taliban ran the country decades ago 
my real fear uh, to work to work over previous comments is the impact it's going to have on girls' education moving mm. forward. But we need to find a way to create a safe route so that people can, can flee uh, and just uh, kind of relying on you know the best endeavours of neighbouring countries it isn't enough. So we do need to be doing um, more more in regards to this. But again, you know, when we're talking about Afghan uh, refugees um, and the U Ukrainian uh, refugee programmes, they're world apart. You know, we need to be doing much, much more uh, for a crisis, which mm -hmm. you know most people, you know, as far as they're concerned, it's not been in the news for months. But it's you know it's real crisis issues. Richard, I think in broad answer to the question, you know, obviously the deal that Trump did, and then the fact that Biden didn't go back on it was what is the reason we've ended up where we are. There's no way that the UK could have done a, and I said a, a, that. anything. Oh, no, I know, I, I, and, and I, I acknowledge totally acknowledge that. And I, and, and Christian's right that Ben Wallace was at the forefront of trying to. He did try and change that, but the, you know there just wasn't international will to do so. I think that the, the most dangerous thing at the moment is um, the fact that the safe routes are being closed down because if you can't leave the house then it's very difficult to then get anywhere um you know to 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 be, to be moved anywhere um and i totally agree um with what's been said and um, by the other panelists around this i think we have to have um particularly women's rights at the center of the foreign policy it's something that i think both parties have supported education for women uh, proper uh, you know as 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 the main emancipator of of change of really changing lives and actually driving beneficial societal change around the world and i really hope that uh, the work that lord arm is doing in that will 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 bear fruit emily well i would say that this does well, it's devastating the way that women are now being treated in Afghanistan. It could have been predicted, and I'm ashamed and very highly disappointed with the way that President Biden dealt with the withdrawal from Afghanistan. But I think this does shine a light on just how evil the excesses of Islamist ideology are. Afghanistan is not alone in the way that it treats women. Elsewhere in the world, women are treated as second-class citizens, forced <coughs> to cover um, awful mutilations, etc., not allowed to work, don't receive education. So I do agree that uh, women's rights should be uh, at the forefront when it comes to foreign policy. Talking of women's rights, Roger has texted in, a few weeks ago, I said I had a bit of a secret crush on Anne Widdicombe. I'd like to amend this to Emily Carver now. How does that make you feel, Emily? <laughs> special? It makes me feel very, very special. I mean, <laughs> Anne Widdicombe has many years of experience on me, but I guess you trumps, trumps that sometimes. Right, let's go to our final text from Sarah in Leicester. I can't quite believe I'm going to read this out, but um, here goes. The Wagatha Christie case has been in the news today with claims that Peter Andre was, quote, hung like a small chipolata. This question could go in one of two ways now. <laughs> with that in mind, what's your favourite kind of sausage, Richard Holden? Um, my favourite kind of sausage is uh, from Keenan's Butchers in Walsingham in my constituency. Oh, there you go. There you go. It's a pork and spicy chorizo. An excellent Fancy. constituency MP answer. Emily. A cocktail sausage, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Beat that, Sarah. Um, a merguez Turkish sausage. Oh, very spicy. There you Christian. Go. Oh, God, it sounds like a mysterious grill. Um, it is, actually, I, I'll, it is. I'll, I'll have to go for the Great British banger as part of a fry up. Well, I hope to be back with you tomorrow night on Cross Question, but if not, you'll know why. Christian Wakeford, Sarah Zaidi, Emily Carver and Richard Holden, thank you very much for joining for this very entertaining edition of Cross Question. Uh, coming up in a moment, we are going to take your calls on whether you think Prince Charles uh, might want to repeat the experience of today where he took over the Queen's duties at the state opening of Parliament. Um, should that be made more or less a permanent role? Should we allow the Queen to retire gracefully and Prince Charles should take over her duties of state right now 0345 6060 973 it's one minute past nine on your radio on global player and play lbc leading britain's conversation this is lbc 
Football's newsroom at nine o'clock. Boris Johnson's being criticised for not using the Queen's speech to promise more support for those struggling with the rising cost of living. The address set out by Prince Charles claimed the government's programme would build the foundations for decades of prosperity. Stuart Hosey is SMP MP for Dundee East, who's also Shadow Cabinet Office Minister, says some of it beggared belief. You've got the public order, which will weaken or legalise the right to protest. You've got Bill of Rights, which appears to attack or restrict the action of lawyers to challenge legislation.